All right, so welcome to another episode of the Comic Book Time Machine. This one's a little bit different, though, because I am actually testing out uh, some video stuff. And the last time I tested out some video stuff for the Comic Book Time Machine, I was actually testing it out for something else, but I was using the Comic Book Time Machine uh, Facebook Live so I could do an unboxing, and that was what I was using to, un to test some equipment. This time I am trying something new. I'm actually trying... Um, something for the comic book time machine but in trying this out and seeing how all this works and, and trying to do something on YouTube I thought you know what I'm not gonna waste this opportunity to actually record about something that I've been wanting to talk about and so that's what this episode is going to be on our YouTube channel it's just gonna be the first video I guess that we ever post and then on the main feed for the comic book time machine podcast the audio version will be there and so um, I'm still I'm going to use it one way or another. But uh, like I said, I'm, I'm kind of experimenting, kind of testing this out. So the idea for uh, what I want to use the YouTube uh, videos for is for some un unbagging, unboxing. Basically, when I open up a blind bag, I thought it'd be fun to actually do a visual presentation of what that would look like. For today, though... I'm going to talk about something a little bit different, and that is Walmart comics. Now, some people listening right now might say, well, that isn't a little bit different. And so if you've been following the podcast, you know that I've been talking about these things, these 100-page giant $5 Walmart comics, since they started. I've been buying them. I, at one point, was buying all of them. And then uh, that would be, I would call it, maybe season one or round one of what they were doing. And now that we're in season two or round two of what they're doing, um, I've dropped almost all the regular purchases of all of the regular titles except for one regular title. And you can guess what that regular title might be. Uh, that's what this one kind of was the launching point for that regular title. That is, this, of course, the Swamp Thing 100 Page Giants. But I've also been buying the, the, the one shots. Now, these are found in the collector's aisle where you know you would find your Pokemon cards, where this is where you would find uh, collectible action figures, like Walking Dead action figures are going to be in that aisle as opposed to um, the toy aisle. Although the toy aisle does have, at, at Walmart, does have some um, collectible toys. There's Godzilla toys. There are Pokemon cards there now as well because there's you know another surge in, in Pokemon popularity. So there's some toys there and then cards there as well. Um, so, I mean, the, the Walking Dead toys wouldn't, be completely out of place if they were in that one especially if there's one side of the uh, action figure aisle that has some other things that are more collectible but that's where these are these these 100 page giants are up front in most stores if not all and they are by all the collectible things 100 pages um some new stories some reprints uh and and five bucks i mean you really almost cannot go wrong with these five dollars 100 pages and it's just it's just good the what i've talked about on the podcast before from beyond the unknown has some really fun bronze age uh reprint stories but then also some really fun um 80s stuff it's just there's some really good stuff in those books the swamp thing stuff i'm really enjoying the new material by phil hester and i can't remember the other uh the other writer but there's just been a lot of fun uh, stuff in that. And then the reprints, it's a double dip for me. The stuff that's being reprinted in the new Swamp Thing material, I've already purchased the uh, the Swamp Thing stuff that they're doing by, by Len Wein. Actually, it's, it's this book right here, Swamp Thing, The Dead Don't Sleep, which is Len Wein's return to the Swamp Thing. And it's, it's a good story, and now it's good enough that I guess I have it a couple times. So... Uh, not the whole thing, um, but but it's getting close, and that's my monthly Swamp Thing fix. Of course, it's not monthly, but I'm also getting Justice League Dark, so between the two of them, I'm getting some new Swamp Thing almost every month. So, uh, But that's not the Walmart comic that I'm here to talk about today. So the Walmart comic that I want to talk about today is, uh, actually there's four of them, and they're from a publisher called Allegiance. And... These people were making waves. This publisher was making waves recently when they revealed that they had a Walmart exclusive, uh, Walmart distribution exclusive. So only Walmart is selling these comics. And I thought, okay, this is going to be some sort of new big 
all ages launch or it was going to be something like that anyway because I was seeing articles and I might have misread them because I was just looking at headlines and I was not reading too many of the interviews or anything like that but I saw a headline where people who were involved in these this Walmart distribution were talking about how comics help people to to learn to read they help kids get interested in reading my my son is proof of this he uh, is in the last year has been reading a lot of comics. Um, well, I got a hundred page giant Teen Titans Go, and then just a couple weeks ago, actually might even been last week, he got the one hundred page comic giant from Walmart that's Teen Titans Go and Superhero Girls, and he's been reading those. He's been devouring Dog Man, um, which is just this you know it's Harold and uh, I can't remember the, the two kids' names, but the two kids from Captain Underpants, this is their other series that they did called called Dogman. And and it has been helpful for him because it's less intimidating in some ways than, than a block of words on the page. And and he's also been reading some books as well. And so this is he's getting excited about reading and one of the things, not the only thing, but one of the things is getting excited about reading is reading comic books. And I'm I'm happy to throw in uh, my own book, uh, Time Flies, is something that he's also been reading and, and getting into because uh, it's a comic, and it's in that in that case, it's because it's by his dad, you know, which is which is kind of nice. But the Walmart comics that I want to talk about are these ones by Allegiance. Now, these comic books, um, as I said, I thought they were going to be all ages. I thought they were going to be in the toy aisle. They are actually not in the toy aisle, not in the collectibles aisle. They are in the book aisle. At Walmart, and they're supposed to be on an end cap. They're so they have a cardboard standy thing that these are going to be that these are sitting in. And, and when I purchased them, uh, you know, I, I pulled them out of that. That that was not on a on a end cap. When I purchased them at my Walmart, um, they were it was on the floor leaning against the the rest of the books. And so I'm not sure what's going on with that. I do know that I've heard some people talking about. Um, Walmart and just kind of being disgusted that the only place you can get these is Walmart and uh, I saw a video about someone and he was just he sounded disgusted he even had to set foot in Walmart and I, I think his exact words were why would I go to Walmart um, and I'll, t- I'll tell you why would I go to Walmart for groceries I mean that's where I get some of my groceries now I, I just I think some of that I, I can understand if you are against Walmart because of their uh, corporate policies then that is absolutely valid Um where I have a problem with people being against Walmart is when they're against Walmart because of their customers. And, you know, you have that website that's like, um, what is it, People of Walmart or whatever, and it's just pictures of people, and it's just to mock them. It's just to make fun of them. And, yes, I, I'll admit, I've seen some of those pictures and kind of laughed myself, and then I started feeling guilty about laughing, and so I've, I've stopped. Um, but, uh, but when people talk about Walmart in that way it really feels it just smacks of elitism um, and, and it smacks of, of judgmentalism and it smacks of other isms that maybe I don't even know uh, the word for but um, you know it, the people who go to Walmart are, are people you know and the people who go to Walmart are going there because it is an easy and convenient place to get their groceries it's cheap now we don't get our main groceries at walmart because we go to aldi which is even cheaper okay so um got a family of seven people you know and you you, you gotta feed them you know and and you gotta do it in a cost-effective way um but these comics were they're they're walmart exclusive i did just find out when i went to my local comic shop that it was originally something that was uh they were available to order by comic shops and those orders were canceled because of the exclusive distribution deal that they made with with Walmart. So I go to my Walmart. I look around. I don't see them. And I think, well, they're books. Maybe they're in the book aisle. And apparently I should have looked there in the first place because I guess that in most of the things that you're reading online, that's what it says to do, that they're going to be at uh, in the, the book aisle. Uh, I was also surprised then how not all ages these are. Now, that's not to say that these are what you would call mature reader books. You know, they're mature books. Don't get me wrong. But they're not mature in the sense that you sometimes see, uh, well, on the on the cover of like a vertical, a vertigo book. A, a vertigo book says for mature readers only or whatever. And the reason they were saying that is because there would be language and nudity and violence and that sort of thing. That's not the case here. When I say mature, I mean, there's just some mature storytelling going on. Um, these are, there, there's some sophistication 
going on in these books. And it surprised me because of, of the location. It surprised me because of some of the things that I thought I had seen in some of the articles saying it was you know going to be all ages and this is something that um, w- was exciting because they're in Walmart and kids can get to them. I don't think the main audience for these is going to be kids. And part of that is because of the time periods. All of these are period pieces. Uh, the one that's closest to not being a period piece uh, ends up going to be to a period, a time period, and, and becomes a period piece. And so I was, I was surprised to see uh, what was going on there with the content of these books. And like I said, thinking that I was looking at an all-ages book. Instead, I was pleasantly surprised to see what these books were. Now, before I get into the, the reviews of the books themselves, I do want to talk about, again, I, I said this is a $5 cover price. Now, What's nice about this $5 cover price is that there's not a lot of ads in here. There, in every book, there's uh, the inside front cover is used for the, the credits. And then it's, it's straightforward. It's, it's all story, no ads, until you get to the end. And even then, it's, it's house ads. It's not um, you know, paid advertisement. Uh, so it has the next, next issue, little um, teaser. Then it has some concept artwork in each of them. And then it also has a little paragraph for each of them that kind of just gives you a little a little sense of where each one of these series is going to go. And then there's you know the house ad for their website and for the other books that are available. And then the back cover has this nice, I, I like this, on all four of the, the back covers, there's just a nice blue symbol that... Um, is part of you know what what you're getting into. So the futurist has this kind of compass thing going on. Um, Nora's saga has this kind of uh, rune picture of like a, um, a Viking hammer. Um, Bass Reeves has this sheriff's star, and then Red Rooster has a blue rooster. But um, that's because it's it's going along with the the style and and it's of the trade dress, not because it's uh, inconsistent with the title. And so that's that's the kind of the packaging that you're getting from each one of these. The other thing that I really like about the packaging is that they are referring to all of these as season one, episode one, kind of like you would a TV show. And so it did kind of set my expectations for when I was reading these. This is basically the pilot episode for each one of these series. And so the pilot episode for a, a TV show is meant to give you a sense of who the characters are, where the show is going, what the show is about. And so I, I read these with that kind of in mind. And so with that in mind, I'm, I'm going to kind of go through these in order of um, how well uh, it works as a pilot episode, but then also that directly translates to how much I liked each one. And there, make no mistake, you know, this, these are not the kind of thing where you're going to like every single one of these titles. There's something to appeal to everyone. The Futurists, like I said, is a period piece that I'm not sure where this is going. And, and so that's something that we'll, uh, we'll talk about in a moment. Nora's Saga is basically a young adult fiction book. Um, and it's, it's got a young female protagonist and dealing with a, a lot of uh, regular life stuff. Red Rooster is a period piece of a superhero show or, or, or story. And then you have Bass Reeves, which is a nonfiction or um, historical fiction. Maybe that's the way to go. But it's a historical fiction about a real-life person. And uh, this is the one that I'm the most excited about, so I'm going to come to this one last. But it is definitely a Western, and that is that is exciting to me. I went to Walmart and bought a Western comic. Um, and along with that, a, a period piece set in... Oh, let's see. I'm trying to remember if this is in the 30s or 40s. I can't remember if it's before or after World War II, but there's this period piece about superheroes as well. So, yeah. So, quickly, I'm just going to review each one of these issues. Uh, first, we have The Futurists, and The Futurists was written by Patrick Stiles. The art is uh, Butch Geese, Geis. Uh, who is someone that I actually am familiar with and, and recognize the name. Uh, the inker is Rick Magyar. And then um, this is the story of, like I said, this is the one that I had the, kind of the least connection to. Uh, they Basically, it's about um, the British Empire. It's about colonialism. It's about some British uh, army soldiers who 
go above and beyond what they're supposed to do when they are kind of putting down some some rebellions and that sort of thing. But they're also looking for, or a couple of them are looking for some mystical uh, elements. And by the end, there's some the release of some crazy mystical god type character. And I don't know where this is going, and and I, and I really didn't have a sense of the characters, and you know it's been a, a week or two since I read this, and and this is the one that stuck with me the least as well. The art is fantastic. Don't get me wrong, the art is fantastic. The the scripting is also good. There's some good lines. There's some good dialogue, um, but it, the book itself, the characters did not stick with me. I did not care that much. Uh, for the characters, I didn't know who I was supposed to care for. There was uh, a couple characters who you know, did some good stuff in the face of some other people who were doing some bad stuff. And in that case, uh, you have people standing up and being heroes at great sacrifice. But I really just didn't have a sense of who they were, what they wanted. Uh, it just, it just, it just didn't stick with me. It's good. Uh, but it's not one I'm going to be coming back to. And when I said this, these books, there's enough of a range between the four of them that they're not for everyone. This is the one that was not for me. I bought it, and I'm glad I bought it. I'm glad to support uh, Allegiance, uh, and and I'm glad to you know dip my toe in and, and see what's going on. But that one's not for me. Then there's Nora's Saga, which is about someone named Nora, <laughs> and she's moved to a new town with her pop, with her dad, and she's dealing with the other kids in the new school, and you know she's dealing with just that school stuff. Throw into that. Her mother's passed away, and um, you know her her dad is doing his best. He's trying his best, um, and then throw into that some mystical stuff that has to do with uh, with Vikings and Vikings who have settled in Canada. <laughs> and so this was kind of fun too. Um, just this whole you know the setting of the of the book is modern day Canada, but they uh, there's some um, I, I don't want to I don't want to spoil too much. Okay, but um, as you can tell. Just by, by looking at the cover, uh, if you do look at the cover, you can see that there are all of these are period pieces. The first one was during you know British colonialism, and this one has some stuff that has to do with Vikings, not Vikings today, but Vikings in the past. And I don't want to talk about too much about how they the past and the present uh, cross over with each other, but I will say that this is a strong book. It, uh, it's third on my list, but the top three are, they're really close to each other. And this is, this is a fun book. And the character of Nora is someone I did care about. And, and her father is also someone I cared about. Now I cared about her father uh, partially because I myself am the father of, of teenagers. And, and so that was, that was helpful actually for me um, that I, I was, you know, Nora is a character that I, I liked and, and could relate to somewhat, having been a new kid in, in high school and having had to deal with, like, the new kid cliques or the old kid cliques, the, the kids who were already there with their pre-established cliques as I was coming into it as a, as a new kid without any friends. And, and so I was able to relate to her there, but I was also able to relate to her father who's just trying to trying to get by and trying to figure out how do I, how do I parent. Now, he has, you know, the added the added uh, problem of, of having to deal with, you know, being a single parent. But, but for me, you know, uh, as a parent of three teenage daughters, <laughs> I was able to relate. Then there's Red Rooster. Now, Red Rooster is, like I said, a period piece uh, about superheroes. And I'm trying to see. I, I can't remember if it's in the 30s or in the 40s. Um, but this one was a, a little bit of a surprise to me as well. Uh, now, what was interesting was reading the book, I didn't get the sense that uh, what this paragraph tells me, where it says, For centuries, the venerable mantle of the Red Rooster passed from generation to generation, battling the most anxious and pernicious evils. Frank Cooper found himself donning the cape and cowl at the dawn of mass media. Motion pictures and radio plays catapulted the once secretive Order of the Dawn into the spotlight of celebrity, potentially to catastrophic, tra catastrophic effect, a risk we all navigate in the era of social media. Now, one thing about these blurbs in each of these books that they do here at the end is it almost felt like it could have been like a Rod Searling narrating this and, and kind of just setting the stage or in this case saying, you know, you just read this and now here's what it's kind of about. Um, 
and I say that in a good way. I, I think that that's actually a, a nice little uh, bit of flavor that you get with each of the books, where it just kind of says, here's, here's a little bit of what it's about. Like Nora's Saga. Actually, I don't want to. Well, maybe I don't want to spoil, so maybe I won't read that. But um, that was a nice little bit of flavor. I, I liked that. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm reading actually this book here. It's called Tachyon. And in Tachyon, this is one of the books that I bought. Actually, all of these 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 Walmart books and then Tachyon here I was able to get these uh, these cheap and Mr. Miracle this Mr. Miracle hardcover and this reprint facsimile edition of Secret Origins of the Superheroes and then I also got these uh, Adam Strange um, prestige books there's three of them and uh, this is one series I, I believe Professor Middleton on the Quarterbin podcast talked about them professor allen not professor middleton but um he talked about that adam strange series but these are all books that i bought like right after businesses started opening i, I did an episode on the podcast about um the books that i bought right before quote unquote quarantine happened these are the ones that i bought right after and tachyon uh what's uh i like it i actually like it a lot more than i thought i was going to but it has these two page long essays in the first and second issue i don't know about the third because i haven't gotten there but these essays and, and comic books did that a lot often with the new series but the editor wrote these essays it's kind of getting into the science and you know i was having dinner with paul cooperberg and blah 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 blah, blah. and it it just this was nice the the one paragraph little uh little blurb for each of these books was really nice the other thing i just have to say is all of these titles have fantastic art, just wonderful art that fits the tone of the book perfectly. And so this one, again, this one you're jumping right in. You're trying to figure out what's going on as you're reading. It gives you a little bit more, it gives me anyway, a little bit more than the futurists did to kind of understand what is the motivation behind the characters that we're looking at. What is the motivation behind the good guy or good guys because it is a team? And what is the motivation behind the bad guys, which are also a team? And why are these bad guys, you know, banding together? And there's still some mysteries. There's still some things that haven't been revealed. I I wonder if with the futurists, if I would be more interested if I had picked up the graphic novel instead of just this pilot episode. But um, for season one, episode one of Red Rooster, I, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a lot. There's superhero action, uh, but then there was also just the, the back backstory the be behind the scenes of what's going on with him because he's not just a superhero who's donned the the cape and cowl as as part of this legacy that's been going on for generations he's also a movie star and he also has to do um endorsements and he has to you know do advertisements and um he and his team they all they all work together on that stuff and there's just there's just some really interesting things the other thing i really liked about this was the bad guy. There's just this element to the bad guy, um, the, the primary antagonist, I should say, who's bringing together all of the other bad guys. And this element where he just has bugs crawling on him. And and some of the other people who are uh, eating with him at, at this, this, this summit, I guess, of, of, of villains... Uh, just kind of noticed, like, what's going on? Why is there a bug there? Is that supposed to be there? And I liked it. It's a really neat little detail that just made that character. I don't know much about him. I don't know what his powers are, and I don't know exactly what his beef is against Red Rooster. I mean, there's there's some of that that's put in here, but uh, I want to know more about that guy, and I want to know more about Red Rooster. And so this one gives me enough information that I feel like I kind of know where things are going, but then it also holds back enough information that I really want to dig in and find out more. And then there's this one, Base Reeves. Now, Base Reeves, you may have seen this picture before online, this picture of this mustachioed marshal, African-American marshal. And uh, when you see that picture on, on social media, oftentimes it will have some sort of blurb that says, this is the man who probably or possibly inspired the Lone Ranger as a character. And this, I've also seen some some memes with him where um, it lists all the things that he's done. Like he captured this many guys. He only killed this many people in the course of his career. 
and then it says, you know, someone will make the the comment, I want to see this movie. Why hasn't anyone made this movie yet? Well, they haven't made the movie yet, but here is the comic book. And the other thing that really excited me about this one, and I'm going to get the name wrong, but I'm taking my friend Daniel Butcher's uh, advice uh, very, very seriously by just saying the name confidently and hoping it's right, but just moving on and, and being confident about it. But Kevin Grivo is the writer on this. Now, Kevin Grivo, I'm really sorry about messing your name up. I, I met him, though. I, I met him once. He's one of those brushes with greatness that, you know, everyone has at least one or two celebrities that you kind of brushed with. And, and he's, he's mine or one of mine. Um, one of the very few, I should say. And the reason I got to meet him is because I was working with Alias Comics at the time. And Alias was uh, set up at San Diego Comic-Con. And this was the only time I've gone to San Diego Comic-Con. I went there. I was able to work on um, you know, selling my books, uh, Lullaby and Imaginaries. I say my books, but books that I worked on with, with Mike Miller. And um, that he had... I'm just going to put it out there. He came up with the idea. I helped him write the script. And I, you know, so I was there, though. And and so was Kevin. And this guy, man, this guy is huge. He has this awesome, deep voice. Um, and he's he's an actor. He's a writer. And, he, you know, he's a comic book writer. But he's also a movie writer. He is the creator of uh, Underworld or one of the creators, I'm not sure if he's the original creator, but I'm pretty sure that he wrote the original script. And then um, he actually w was an actor in Underworld as one of the, I believe, one of the werewolves. I haven't seen the movie, so I'm not sure. I then look at his credits on IMDb. I didn't realize that he was in more things than just that. I thought he was in Underworld because he just, you know, got to know producers and stuff on that movie because he was the writer. And they were like, dude, your voice, it's awesome. Your, your body, we don't have to, like you know, buff you up or anything, you know, we'll just put the makeup on you and, and you're going to be this awesome, huge, gigantic werewolf warrior or whatever. Uh, but no, he's actually an actor. He's been in a lot of things. And I, I was surprised to see how many things he had been in. He's the writer of this book. And, and I, I'll just back to, uh, back to my flex, I guess. Um, I, I got to talk with him a little bit about some things he wanted to do, some story ideas he had. I talked about some of the story ideas that I had, and it was a fun conversation. It was very short, and I, I think it might have been like two short conversations, but um, yeah, I felt very small talking to him, very small as a person because he's just this giant man, and also very small as a writer because he just has this body of work, and he's just done some really, really good stuff. And when I say he's done some really, really good stuff, I also mean this. This is really, really good stuff. It is historical fiction, uh, but it is about this real-life U.S. Marshal, Base Reeves. And uh, so you've got a, It's a Western. That's the thing that excited me. I didn't realize. I, I didn't recognize the name. Um, when I, when I was looking at this, I was just like, oh, cool. Oh, Western, you know, and then, uh, I'm reading along and I'm like this, there's some elements here that sound a little bit familiar. I wonder where, where the story came from. Is, is this a real life? And then you get to the end and there he is the legend, you know, and it says, um, Reeves spent nearly 20 years in his role as the first black U.S. Marshal to serve west of the Mississippi. By the time he retired in 1909, after some 32 years in law enforcement, he had laid claim to apprehend more than 3,000 fugitives, facing down some of the most dangerous criminals America's ever known. He was an exemplary lawman, hailed for his marksmanship, his detective skills, and for an unwavering moral code that, in one particularly dark and telling chapter, even saw him arrest his son for murder. Now, again, this is not in the story itself uh, to let us know where this story is going. But the main thing that's happening here is you have him getting involved in getting some bad guys and you have him dealing with some family stuff. And then you have someone coming to him and saying, we need a, a marshal for this lawless land and you're the man for the job. Will you do it? And he has this, this moral um, conundrum, uh, should he do it or not? And, you know, cause it's going to mean being away from his family. It's going to mean, uh, putting himself in danger. And then of course, I mean, you know, he's, he's going to do it, you know, but, uh, this as a pilot episode is a standalone comic in many, many ways. 
it makes you want more, but it gives you a complete story. And I, of all of these, this is the only one that gives you, uh, or gave me anyway, the sense of a complete story. And so I really enjoyed Base Reeves. It was, it was good stuff. Um, I'm not just saying that because I've, I've met the guy who wrote it. Um, that's just a happy bonus for me. <laughs> so it also gives me an opportunity to flex a little bit about a brush with greatness and a brush with a great writer. So, yeah, so that is the Base Reeves season premiere. Overall, uh, as you're looking at all of these, there's going to be something that most people, especially most people who are into comic books, are going to be interested in. Also, because of the things that they're doing, people who are not into comic books, people who are not into superheroes, they are also potentially going to be interested in what these books have to offer. So that is my uh, review and an overview of the Allegiance comics. Um, I just have to say to them, uh, kudos and congratulations and nice job, nice work. So I'm going to piece this together, this episode together, and we'll see what happens with it. I mean, and it'll get posted on YouTube. It'll get posted to the, the regular feed. And then um, I'm still figuring this YouTube thing out. I've got uh, my friend uh, Jamie from J Hood Creative, who I'm uh, a guest with him on one of his monthly he does a bunch of different things on his YouTube channel. And one of the things he does once a month, and, and I'm a part of the issue at hand. And so I've been kind of picking his brain just a little bit. I'm trying not to bug him too much, but I, I'm, I'm really interested in, in, in doing the YouTube side of things because there is that visual element of opening up those, those packages of comics and, and pulling them out, completely ruining any collectability that, that it had by being this sealed and and basically a mystery box you know it's the, it's the jj abrams mystery box you know if you never open it the possibilities of what could be in that bag are are endless but uh but i like to open it up i want to see what's in there and and i'm not I don't, i'm not worried about collectability that's why i am not buying some of those more expensive bags that you might find on ebay and there are some really expensive bags on ebay that are really really cool that i would really really love to get my hands on but i am not spending that much money on on a bag that I'm just going to open up, read the comics, and then, I don't know, maybe hopefully eventually turn around and sell them. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen with my collection. I've got to weed it down. That's one of the problems that every comic book collector has, I think. So with that said, I just want to say I hope that you're reading what you enjoy. I hope that you're enjoying what you read, and, and I hope that uh, you have a, a blessed day and a great tomorrow, and... As you go out into the wilds of Walmart to maybe try and find these comic books, I want to wish you Godspeed. <laughs>